Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. I have a game I want to show you that's in progress. Uh, they're at the middle game right now. And this is by Walter Brown. This is a great picture of Walter Brown. Look at him focusing, man. That is such a great picture. Now, unbeknownst to myself, but known to all of you, Walter Brown was the six-time United States chess champion. I knew he was good. I didn't realize he was that prominent. And that's to expose my vast fund of ignorance of chess personalities. This is in the uh, February 2013 uh, Chess Life. It's the one with Kasparov and two of the youth under 12 who won gold across the seas back then. But right now, I want to focus on this game. This is such a fabulous position. I, I was really surprised how Brown put this. He says, when Chess Life asked me for my best move in chess, he said, I, I thought of many moves that, that I had had, but he said, it, my best move was in this game, and he, he takes us to this position. He said, this is my best move. And he said, I voluntarily offered my queen to Bent Larson, an uncompromising world-class grandmaster for many decades, who in 1970 had played on first board versus the Soviets when Fisher was board number two. And he says, okay, yeah, yeah, he basically, that's, that's all, yeah, that's all I wanted you to know. The rest of it's about personal stuff. His very best move in life, of course, was to marry his wife, who was, in 2013, he'd been married to for 40 years. So, way to go, Walter. Now, I have changed the color of my pieces, yes, some of you asked about they used to be red, and I painted them kind of a cream color so that I could help the colorblind people who watch my videos. Apparently, there's millions of them. <laughs> well, not really millions, but hey, a guy can dream, can't he? No, it was too light, so I have made these a little bit more tan. I'm trying to make sure everyone gets to see the board easy, so just work with me, will you? I think that's a better contrast than I've ever had so far on the game. The problem is they made this vinyl board with green and white squares. I, I don't know why they made it those colors, but oh well. It works. I think that works better. Now you can see the white pieces. They're tan, but I'm going to call them white as opposed to the black pieces, right? Just call me a genius, man. I just spray painted the pieces and ta-da! There they are. Okay, let's go on to this. What was or, uh, Brown's move, he went to E6. <laughs> Fabulous, interesting move. E6, offering his queen to Bent Larson. Now that is one of those shocker moves. And here was Brown's comment. He said, this is one of those magical moments almost surreal, both the queens and the four minor pieces were caught in a web of counter threats. And when you observe this board, he, we, what I'm going to do is a little different in this video. I'm going to show you that situation. It's Brown's analysis, but I'm going to share the four different variations of what could have happened from this startling E6 move. Now he says the queen took C3. That was the response of Larson. Okay? So let's go back before Larson moved. 
and demonstrate systematically a detailed analysis of this most remarkable position here where four minor pieces are caught in a web of counter threats and let's explore each one of those. After the move to E6, one possible option is for white to immediately put the king to g2. And the reason why will become obvious in a little while. So, the next move would be knight takes the bishop and the queen comes to f4. And then the knight comes to d5. Remember, this is Brown's, uh, and he says that's a key retort right there. And now the queen comes to h4. Queen will go to f8. Queen will take c4. So he got the piece back, which he knew he would. Now it's time for Brown to bring in the bishop and the excellently placed knight here at d5 plus the weakened kingside target over here for the bishop means that white has the better, or I mean black has the better position. So that's one possible option that white had with brown offering the queen. Now hang on, I'll reset the board up and I'll show you the next option. The next option after e6 is for white to just take the queen. But let's see if the, what if he would have simply taken the queen Here's the problem with that move. Now, the knight takes f3 check, forking the queen and the king. Yeah, so the king comes to h1. Knight will take the queen. And now the bishop will come to a5. And the knight will take c4. And the bishop will take c3. So they're even as far as the exchange. However, watch what happens. Bishop to d7. Then he pushes to f4. And then he goes rook f8, nabbing the file and putting pressure on the pawn. He has a very strong center, Brown says. And his well-placed pieces coordinated better than the white pieces and he's two pawns to the good and he says this is a better position for black also had white simply accepted the queen so that's option number two hang on and I'll get back to the regular position and I'll show you option number three so let's take a look at option number three. Brown has offered the queen. What if the other option is he declines taking the queen and the knight takes f3 anyway and he's forking the bishop and the queen. Then the queen can take c3 like so and the knight can take g5 like so. And then he can push f4, putting the question to the knight, and the knight can come up here to e4, threatening the queen. Queen can come to e3, and then d5. Notice the push here with the central pawns. Look at that center that Brown has in this option. That is potent stuff, man. Um, that, that is a tough romp for white here and then he brings up the bishop 
and the bishop will take e4, and then the d will take e4, and if the queen takes the, no, the queen, yeah, then the bishop comes to here, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's not a very that's a that's a nice skewer there if that was to happen. And he's got two extra pawns still. So that also on the third option, it just seemed like every option Brown said he analyzed in his head during this game, every option favored black. So far we see it does. Now what's the fourth option? And then we'll play out how the game actually played. Hang on, I'll be right back. Don't go away. More fun and goodies. Finally, a fourth option showing his contention that the four minor pieces were caught in a web of counter threats. Is in, he offered the queen, what if the bishop just came back to e2? Well, that leaves Brown an option. He can take it with the, with the knight, like so. And then the queen would take e2. And then the queen could take g5. Oh, whoops, I forgot to move the king back. Dang it, it ruined my analysis. Dang it, man. <laughs> the queen could take g5 and put the king in check. And then the king could come to h1. And then the bishop comes up to d7, and now rook goes to g1. So now we're getting kind of some tough stuff. Queen can go to h5. Rook can come to g3. He might, he's attempting to double the rooks. That might be interesting, huh? Bishop up to c6. Rook comes to a3. Now, watch what happens in this variation. The strategy, the idea that Brown talked about in his nifty little article is now, if it went this route, he could just pile pressure on that poor little g3 pawn. That is what, notice he's hitting it with the queen and the knight, and, and when he brought the bishop up, that forces white to bring his rook here instead of over here and doubling the rooks. Now white is on defense. He's got to protect that pawn. See how this is working? That's why the rook came up to a3, and then rook f8, he just keeps piling on that poor pawn. Really interesting how this works. And now finally, king to g2. So in this variation, what we're seeing is white is completely forced to defend that pawn with everything he's got. And that makes it so that black has the initiative. And he says here, he said, this is a devastating response from piling on F3. And you go, well, no, he's got it protected. So let's take a look, though. What if rook takes F3? Or no, not that one, this one. What if the rook took the, the pawn, or the rook took the rook? Then the knight will take the rook, and the rook will take the knight, and the bishop will take the rook, and that's a great fork check. So the queen takes the bishop, and the queen takes the queen check, and the king takes the queen, and now black wins the pawn ending. He just simply starts bringing his king into this game, blam, and he's going to win the pawn ending. So it was fascinating that the psychology against Larson that Brown used by offering him his queen 
is extremely interesting. You can see it appears that with all the options, whether the queen is taken or not directly, or with all of the minor pieces, black is going to win this game. However, let's play through the actual game as it happened now and see what actually happened. I'll be right back. Don't go away. You're not going to want to miss this. So now that we've seen all four really interesting variations that favored black, how did the game really go? Brown offers his queen in a real shocking move. That was the heart stopper. Larson went ahead and took the knight. So here we go. What happens now is Brown went check. So now we're doing a direct frontal attack. Yeah. King goes to h1. And now Brown is going to solidify his position. This is really possible and really good to do because he is up two pawns. So he can and should strengthen his position for the end game that's going to happen. So this is what we see him doing. A very solid way to play chess. Rook F to D1, going to attack this backward pawn, right? He doesn't worry about this. He comes to F4 with his queen. He's gently making sure each one of his pieces are better placed than the white pieces. And you don't have to be in a hurry to do this. So he's not. You'll never see, well, I shouldn't say never, never say never, but seldom do grandmasters really hurry fast to get an attack going before they strengthen their position. There's a great lesson for us there, right? Rook goes ahead and takes the pawn. So there's a pawn down. The knight takes a pawn, so he's keeping up with the material exchange while at the same time strengthening his position. And you say, yes, but black or white now has the open file and he can attack, and that's true. That is very true, and that is what he does. Rook d8, king comes to f7, King comes to g2. Gotta keep that king safe, right? Queen to g5 check. Porking the rook. <whistles> Fabulous move. Now what? King to h3. Watch what happens next. It's a move you wouldn't expect at all. Well, I mean, some of you will because you're so much smarter than I was, than I am. I did not see this coming, but it makes sense as we watch this game unfold. Queen to h4 check instead of taking the piece right now. Let's make sure we have control of this game. He's kept the fork. But watch how this plays out. This is so interesting how this plays out. King to g2. Knight to d4. And he's got an exclamation point here. Watch what happens. Rook takes d4. He has to. He's virtually forcing his hand because he's got a checkmate option coming up with his bishop and knight here. So he has to, white has to get rid of that combination. Very interesting, right? He gets the rook anyway, just not with the fork using the queen. He gets it by eliminating more pieces first, which gives him a really good endgame. 
Because now, rather than immediately taking the piece, the power. <laughs> I know, there's some people who just hate it when I say, oh, the power was taken. Well, all right, fine. The major piece, rather than taking it immediately, he improves his position by getting that long diagonal against the king where the king is. He's going to limit... Notice the queen is here controlling this file and this file and that angle. And now he's going to limit where the king can go. This game is getting tough for white. Systematically improving his position. Don't worry about hunting down the piece just yet. Very interesting. And now look. You say, oh, see, he blew it already, bishop d5. Hold on. No, he didn't. Now, watch how he plays this. Not the pawn takes, but the bishop. He wants to whittle him down because, remember, black has two extra pawns. Does he still have two? Two, four, six, one, two, three, four, yeah. He's got two extra pawns going into the end game, so he is systematically trading down. Very interesting how he does this. The rook will have to take. And now watch. Rather than take it with the pawn again, he goes queen e4 check. And he's got that wicked fork again <laughs> against the queen or the, the king and the rook. Really interesting. There's a uh, there's a subtle psychology here. Brown is showing really strong tactics while he is improving his position, while he is whittling the pieces down. That's real interesting. So the pawn blocks the check. Brown goes ahead and eliminates the rook. And now the, the push with the A pawn and rather than accepting the pawn and goofing up his pawn position. Remember, he's two pawns up. This is going to go to the end game. Keep your pawns intact. Therefore, he just pushed the pawn. Keep those pawns together, man. Don't take the pawn and double up the pawn. See, that gives this rook a chance to come in. And then you're in trouble. No, you double up your pawns, you have an isolated pawn, and an isolated pawn, no, no. No, far better to push that pawn. That's kind of a cool little thing to see, and the reason for it, yeah? I think so. Look, we'll come over to E1 now. So he, once Brown showed he didn't take the pawn, now it's time to get the rook into here. And the rook will come to d8. Very good. Rook e2. Queen g5. Check. King f2. Rook to d1. Now, get, now look who gets to use the open files, yeah? This open file business is a really important part of this game. Because now Brown's position is simply better. And he has the material extras to make it so. And then the rook comes to e1. And now queen comes to h4 check. And that is where Bent Larson, the great Bent Larson, resigned to the great Walter Brown. This was fun to see. It, it, it took great insight he had the calculating ability to see the four different options. There's no way I could have, so there's no way I could play that quality of a chess game by offering my queen like that. That would have just made me nervous. I knew I could see that he had the fork, though, when the king was back here and the queen was here. I saw he had the fork with the knight, but to offer the queen first, wow. That takes some, that takes some courage of conviction, doesn't it? Yeah, that, that's good calculating. So, fun game, really cool. 
All right, you guys, I haven't started my new Rappel Say piece yet, so I'll show that to you probably in the next game or so. In the meantime, remember, it is a beautiful day. Get out and enjoy your day. Enjoy every moment because you know, in reality, I'm a big fan of Alan Watts. I love reading Alan Watts. And he, along with several others, many, many philosophers have noted this also. He says that the moment right now is what is real. The past is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. The future has yet to come. It's not here right now. Right here, right now is what's real. So enjoy every moment. You know that saying, take time to smell the dandelions. Yeah, take time to smell the roses and have your experience of the moment. Because this is where we're at and this is when we're at. So be good, do well, have fun. There's your philosophy lesson, a mini lesson in the midst of a great chess game. And do good and be happy. Be happy, smile, man makes people wonder what you've been doing. So I do it all the time. It's great. It's fun. Keep them guessing, baby. Hey, I will see you guys in the next chess video.